inception here. Hey, what's up, guys? So, <laughs> totally unplanned. Um, I, you know, I had no idea that I was going to end up here in my old high school. So, we are in Portland, Tennessee, in my old high school. See, that's the boys' dorm. Hey, what's up, Chris R? <laughs> So that was where I, that's where I went, I stayed, in the, in the dorm right there. Hey, what's up, Hash Miner? Yo. <laughs> so that was the boys' dorm, and that was the school, the main building that, you know, where we took all the class, where we, you know, where all the classes were. Um, and then, oh, my name was Pedro in Spanish class there. Anyways, <laughs> that's the girls' dorm, where I sent a pornographic uh, <laughs> picture. Um, it was, it was pixelated. It was like... Anyways, it was a joke. I thought it was very funny. I actually didn't know. I didn't know that how, how creepy that was. I didn't know how weird that was. And I do now. But the thing is, hey, what's up, our favorite groomer? Hey, Patty, you are in for a story. Okay, this is totally in pen. When I was here at this boy's dorm, I was like 15 years old. Hashman, I haven't watched your videos in a while. How are you? Um, I'm doing great. So I'm here visiting my wife and my, fam my wife's family. They live in Hendersonville, which is coincidentally about 30 minutes away from where I went you know went to high school here and this is where I was a senior class pastor for my class I was a president of bell choir bing 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 <laughs> anyways I'm um, right there at the building over there um I was you know played bell choir but this is where I this was my high school in Tennessee we're like at the Tennessee Kentucky border um hey what's up Pauline so when I was there, we, there was an old computer, like this computer had to be from like the 60s or something, 70s, you know, really old computer. And you type in this command. I forget what what the command was, but it was this, it was this inside joke. I mean, it was like passed down from like, you know, <laughs> you know, seniors, you know, down to the underclassmen. So anyways, um, there was this pixelated, very like, I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't even pornographic. I don't think it would, it would qualify as pornographic, but you could definitely tell. <laughs> but anyways, I thought it was funny. So I printed it out and I, I wrote, hand wrote on the page to this girl, because we always kind of joked around, and she, or she joked around with me, you know, about stuff that made me feel uncomfortable because, you know, I was so shy. I was super shy. So she thought it was funny. So I just thought, I thought it would be funny too, right? And so I, I, I wrote it to her. I was like, dear, I forget her, I forget her name now. But I was like, um, you know, uh, I, I did a stupid poem. I was like, sleep tight. Uh, no, no. Good night, sleep tight. Don't let the big bed bugs bite. That's what I wrote. And I, I even signed my name, June, you know, and I, I signed it. And uh, I remember my mom, my parents, my parents were called up here when I was being expelled, <laughs> when I was getting kicked out of the school um, for that. <laughs> and we're in the principal's office and the principal shows my mom and dad the letter I sent over to the girl's dorm and why I'm being kicked out. And they even read it to them. It's like, good night, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. And, <laughs> you know, June. And they're, I'm like... And my everybody, my brother, he was like, why would you put your name on it? <laughs> I was like, I didn't know. I didn't know how weird that was, you know? Anyway, so I got expelled. Uh, <laughs> I got expelled. But then I think everybody knew. <laughs> Chris Sars is ha too funny. That would be so embarrassing. It was. They called the town hall meeting and they showed everybody. The whole school saw it. And then... That's the thing is like, it, there's, there's one thing about finding out how awkward of a person you are, how socially awkward you are. There's one thing about finding that out, like, you know, in a, in a private environment. So, you know, like a good close friend, you know, just kind of levels with you one day, <laughs> says, hey, we're friends, right? Just to be frank, just to be real with you. You're kind of weird, man. You know, <laughs> you're kind of weird. You got to You got to tone that down a little bit, you know, work on your small talk game a little bit, you know. And if somebody would have leveled with me like that, it would have been awesome. But this was entire the whole, in front of the whole entire school, the girls' dorm, and the boys' dorm, and the village students. There's students that <laughs> village students. They call them village students. The, the students that live around here that don't stay in the dorms. Everybody, all the adult staff, and they. I'm, I'm looking like a pervert. I'm looking like some freak. You know, like duh, I was like, I thought it was funny. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> So, oh my goodness, another story. Um, behind that main building here, uh, the reason why I step back, oh shoot. The reason why I step back in the car is because it's so cold out here. But behind that main building there, so, 
I tried to show my wife, but they tore it down. I, I heard rumors that they tore down the brick pile, um, but I didn't really believe them. I was like, surely the, at least the shed will still be there, right? Like a relic to the brick pile, right? But everybody told me that after I graduated from this school that they got rid of the brick pile because I proved that the brick pile was not, <laughs> that the brick pile doesn't work. So what the brick pile is, it's, uh, we had, they had a point system. So if, you, if you're tardy to a class, you get one point. If you miss a class, if you're absent, you get three points. For every 12 points, you move the brick pile. Now the brick pile <laughs> was a huge stack of bricks, right? I think it was like 13 levels, but it was thousands of bricks crisscrossed, you know, so that you can just shove it. So anyways, it was a huge pile of bricks, right? You had to move it from one corner of the shed to the other corner. And that was your punishment because it was physical labor, but it had to be unproductive because if it was productive labor, then that's like child labor laws, you know? So it had to be something that was physically demanding and a punishment, but not productive. You can't build a wall. So I got good at this. <laughs> and I preferred moving the brick pile once a week rather than going to classes. So I would just skip all the classes. I would just sleep. And I'm right here. I'm literally right here in the boys' dorm, sleeping in my room because I didn't want to make this walk <laughs> to the main building to go to class. So I would just skip all my classes. I was like, why? What for? I don't see the point of going to class. So then I would just move the brick pile once a week. And I, I got so good at it because there was holes. So I would, I would grab four bricks, like two bricks, in one hand, two bricks in the other hand, squeeze them tight together with two bricks in the middle, and I would move six bricks at a time in a line. And I was, I mean, it was just like my weekly workout. I would look forward to it. But anyway, <laughs> oh man, it's cold out there. I was telling them about the brick pile. Uh, so I try to show them the brick pile, but uh, they weren't lying. They got rid of the brick pile. <laughs> so yeah, that's crazy, right? So anyways, Wow, um, I was telling my wife, that's the impact that I made here <laughs> at this school. I am legendary. Shoot, if it wasn't for me, kids, kids would still be moving bricks from one corner of the shed to the other. It would take a while. I mean, even though I got good at it, it still took me like a good two hours <laughs> sweating, scraping up my fingers because I, didn't, I wouldn't wear gloves. Because if you wear gloves, you can't really stick your fingers in the hole, so you can't move as many at a time. So anyways, my daughter's passed up. <laughs> So that's why I'm up here. Uh, my, my, they just helped my mom, my wife just helped her mom move from Arizona to Tennessee here in Hendersonville. It's my daughter's eighth birthday. I wasn't going to miss it for the world. So I, I drove up here from Atlanta this morning, <laughs> four hours. And so it took more than that because Atlanta traffic. But anyways, um, yeah, spending a birthday with my younger daughter there passed out now they were playing so hard with the nintendo switch <coughs> that's what she wanted for her birthday present so got a nintendo switch got a couple of games so they were playing games so now they're tired <coughs> and i literally i didn't know that we were going to stop by my, my school here we we're just we we're just kind of going through the options talking about like what, what should we do you know i was like i'm up for anything i have no plans i was like i was just i'm just gonna, i'm just here to do whatever you girls want to do um, but yeah, like they were like, let's just let's go see your old school since we're right here. So anyways, here we are It's so cold. I thought maybe we, I would wake them up and we'd walk around but it's so cold and freezing that I think Yeah, maybe next time I'll do a walk around but man, it's just really interesting because you 20 years ago, I graduated in 99. Can you believe that? 20 years later here I am back in my old school Highland Academy you know, I was a kid. I was a kid when I stayed there. Oh my goodness. And now I'm here 20 years later with my own two kids. <laughs> crazy, crazy how life comes back in like full circle. And this is where I was going around to different churches doing like, uh, you know, sermons and stuff. You know, I, I literally thought the Holy Spirit was working through me and speaking through me. And maybe, maybe... Maybe it was, I don't know, but this is actually where I went door to door selling Christian books because in order to help my parents with the tuition here, um, you know, staying at the dorm, you know, it all costs money, thousands of dollars, the food, the cafeteria. And so we all had jobs here if you're staying at the dorm. And so my job, um, well, at first, my freshman year was the cafeteria and I loved it. I, I was doing pots and pans. They had different stations that they would rotate you around. Anyways. 
<clears throat> um, I even got awarded Employee of the Year uh, my freshman year at the cafeteria. Anyways, so now my freshman year, I worked at the cafeteria, but my junior year, um, there's this new program where you could go door to door and sell Christian books. And if you sell the books, you get 50% commission. And they broke down the numbers. And for me, it's just like, cha-ching, you know, like money signs went off in my head. And I was thinking, like, oh, my God, it, by selling books door to door, I could just pay for my whole tuition here. My parents didn't have to, my parents don't have to pay for anything, you know. And so that was my motivation to make money. And so I started, I started going door to door selling Christian books. But it wasn't really working out. I wasn't really selling. And it was, it was hard. It was getting, I was getting rejected. And it was scary. I would feel so nervous, start shaking before I knock on the doors, you know. And then the person would answer the door, I'd start shaking, you know. Uh, but anyways... <laughs> it got easier and I, I remember thinking if I want to sell these books better I better start reading them and it might help in my presentation if I actually read the books and I can show them you know parts of the books you know and stuff and so that's what I did I started reading the books and as I started reading the books it really started to change me and then I got into it at first to make money but then as I started to read these books and it really started to change me because I was a punk kid I mean, especially in the boys' dorm there, I was a punk. And I would, I, would, I would sneak cigarettes even my freshman year. I thought it was so cool. And so, yeah, I would sneak off to eat um, McDonald's. Because we, you know, it's, it's all vegetarians. You know, we're not allowed to eat meat. And we'd, we'd like, you know, sneak in some McDonald's, hamburgers and stuff. I was a rule breaker, you know. I was a punk. And I thought I was so cool. But then as I started to read the Bible and read it, start reading these books and reading, the, you know, the um, there's a Bible study guide that we sold. When I went through that, I was just like amazed. And, and the great controversy, the life and the desire of ages, you know, the life of Jesus. Um, uh, there's so many books I started reading. And I was like, oh, my God, it literally changed me. And then and then I wasn't selling books anymore. I was I was a literature evangelist. And now I had a mission. And. Like, the crazy thing is, when I stopped trying to sell the books, the books started selling. Isn't that weird? <clears throat> this one example, um, I was at this one lady's house, and they called them devil's rabbits. <laughs> oh, my God. First of all, can we just address that? What a horrible word to call somebody, a devil's rabbit. If somebody called me a devil's rabbit, I'd be like, I don't even know what that means. But I'm offended. You know, like... <clears throat> Why would you call me that? You know, like, what? I'd be confused and angry at the same time. Like, what? But anyways, they call them devil's rabbits because they're people that just take up your time and, and you know, take up your sympathy. They tell you their story and everything. They get you to pray with them. Take up all your time and they don't buy any books. They call them devil's rabbits. I was like, that's, that's messed up. <clears throat> I didn't like that at all. Even while I was working there, I was like, that's messed up. And so, because I wasn't there to sell books. I was there to witness and selling books was just a nice side effect, right? And so when I met this lady and she invited me in, because I told her I was a Christian student, and she was like, um, you know, will you pray for me? And I was like, of course I will. That's what I do. <laughs> and so she was telling me about everything that happened. And I don't even remember all the details, but I remember it just really touched me. And I was showing her some books and some quotes from the books that really, you know, I thought was, was uh, relevant to what she was going through. And she was saying, telling me, like, I, I, sir, I'm really sorry, but I can't, I can't afford, I can't buy your... And I was like, I know, shoot, you just told me what happened. I know you can't afford the books. I want to give them to you. And, um, you know, she... I remember she cried, and we prayed together. And she, remember, she was like, are you going to get in trouble? And I was like, no. I was like, God's going to take care of me, you know? And he always did. And whenever I would do stuff like that, just give books away... He would always make it, like, like, it would always somehow make it up, in, you know, at the end of the day. But other people would give me more money, you know, and it would somehow even, like, and so, <clears throat> and there was a couple times, I admit, there was a few times where <laughs> I came up short at the end of the day <laughs> and I got in trouble because they would talk to me about this repeatedly and I would get in trouble a lot because I would call them on the walkie-talkie after spending like an hour or two at someone's house empty no sales and they're like why did you spend two hours in there then you know it's like these people needed some <laughs> they needed some you know they needed some prayers you know like 
God sent me there. What, do you, what am I supposed to do? God sent me there. I mean, I didn't make the call, you know? <laughs> Anyways, um, but there were nights where it wouldn't even out. And I think that was just God saying like, hey, you're pushing it. <laughs> you know, like I've covered you enough. Shoot, now you're taking advantage. You're pushing it, buddy. You're on your own at this time. So there's a couple of times, you know, I was left on my own to, to deal with the consequences. But that night, I, I, I told her, God usually takes care of it. God usually takes care of it. Don't worry. And so I, I left her house and I, I kind of knew I was in trouble, but I didn't care. And so I went to the next house and it was, you know, nothing. But then the next house and the whole rest of the street. And I knew, at, in my heart, I knew it was the Holy Spirit rewarding me for my faith and for my service. That's what I believed. But now that I, I kind of think back on it a little more rationally, a little more logically, I think what happened <laughs> is just like um, our neighbor, Julie, um, you know, my house has my wife's number and they talk. And all the wives seem to talk, you know. I think what happened was when I left that house, I think she called her neighbors. I think she told them what happened. And I think one neighbor told the other neighbor and... It was amazing. I made, I, I, I was selling books like, like they were, you know, like they were hotcakes, you know, I was just, bam. but it was so amazing. And I think that literally it's like, even if you don't believe in God, even if you don't, even if you don't believe in spiritual things or karma, just like it, just uh, think about it like a very scientifically, when you do something good for others, it's the law of reciprocation. They want to do something good back for you, especially if it was um, graceful, you know? And so by, by giving the books, because I genuinely wanted to help her and I prayed with her and I showed that I cared and she was not able to repay me financially, I think she wanted to find a way to repay me. And I, I don't know this for sure, but I think that she called her neighbors and told them what happened. And that was like one of my best nights. But anyways, I'm getting carried away. Kids are tired. I better go. But anyway... <sighs> I've had so many experiences, you know, at this school. It's just, wow, it's just so weird that I'm back here 20 years. Anyways, you ready to go, honey? <laughs> Sorry, I'm rambling. All right. Well, thank you guys for, um, oh, that punishment didn't work. Yeah, obviously, shoot. <clears throat> David, what's up, David Forrest? Good to see you, Drew. Looking forward to the next one. Wow, David always pops up at the end. He likes to sit back and judge me. And then, <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> I'm just kidding, David. Thank you so much. What I meant to say is thank you. That's what I meant. All right. But anyways, I'm sneaky. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, guys. I'm going to... Uh, I don't even know what we're going to do now. Maybe go, uh, go look for something to eat. David says, my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, thank you for sharing this moment with me. Like, I was telling my wife, I don't even know what I'm feeling right now. I'm, like, feeling all kinds of weird feelings inside, you know? Like... Wow, I totally forgot about this place, you know? Like, I kind of was like, wow, now all these memories are coming back. But anyways, I'll see you guys. What's that? Lots of stories. Yeah, lots of stories. Oh my God, I got so many stories. Oh my goodness. I got slapped in the, this is the first time I got slapped in the face by a girl here in the cafeteria. That was a good one. Holy cow. But anyways, <laughs> I'll see you guys. <laughs>